Hi, Michelle. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you well. Sorry, I was I was just trying to get you on live. How are you? Great, I'm good. We've got some folks already watching us. Great, we've got 12 people, it looks like. 12 people, I see. Should we, should we give folks maybe another couple of seconds to get ready, get comfy? Sure. All right, and then while we sort of get started, uh, I want to, my name is Francisco Fernando Granados. Uh, I'm a visual artist I'm based out of uh, Toronto, Ontario. And I want to welcome you to this live talk with artist Michelle Forsyth through Corkin Gallery. Um, as you probably know, uh, Michelle is a multidisciplinary artist who works primarily in photography and sculpture uh, and redefining the way that these two mediums and other mediums, I think, like performance, painting, printmaking, relate to one another. Uh, throughout our conversation, we are going to be uh, featuring some images from um, the show that, um, an upcoming show that Michelle has with Corking Gallery called Our Relationship is Beautiful Due to Distance. Uh, and the, the work for this exhibition is available in the Core King Gallery website and through a link of Instagram if you check out the, the Core King Gallery uh, website. Uh, the Core King Gallery uh, uh, Instagram uh, link, it'll take you there. All right. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing okay. Yeah. I am have a little bit of a tremor, but that should go away as my pills kick in. Perfect. I'm so glad to I'm so glad to be in conversation with you and so grateful that you invited me to do this. And I'm thankful for you to be able to do it. So as we as we sort of get started, um I if you know in the in the bio that 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 I just sort of read, uh, it talks about the relationship between photography and sculpture, but but as I was saying, your work really and such a wide variety of mediums. Uh, even, even though it is quite multidisciplinary, one thing that I've always felt a connection with in your work is what I think of as, as a very painterly sensibility in your work. There's a kind of striking richness that's really consistent throughout your practice, especially in the way that you handle complexity, visual complexity, compositional complexity and the way in which it feels to me, you push that complexity to its limits. Can you talk a little bit about how you compose the images? How do you start them? What's sort of the, 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 the process of structuring them visually? Yeah, thank you. I think I'll just add a little bit to that is that I've worked as a painter most of my life until more recently when my work got more and more interdisciplinary. Although I have my degrees in photography and sculpture, which is interesting because I've kind of come full circle to that way of thinking and working. But with the painting, I also kind of break certain rules of composition in that most of my images are based in squares and they sit smack in the middle which we're kind of taught not to do, or we're kind of taught to break that a little bit. But when I start working, I typically start with a painting on gouache 10 by 10, kind of to study patterns. And the patterns are not abstract, they come from my clothing. So they're all, you know, indexical in some way, as you can see with the image on the top, top there. There's a piece of my clothing with the yellow plaid and it's sitting on a painting of the same item. And did that answer your question? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that, that I think it, it's true that it's actually quite a particular choice to have the, that square format, particularly in, in, in those sort of more sculptural still lives that you, uh, that you have as part of the show. What does the what does the square give you that a portrait or a landscape format doesn't give you? Well, interestingly, before I worked in the square, 
I was working with two by three, the format of 35 millimeter film because I studied photography as an undergrad in the analog sense. And then I just switched to the square and thinking about the platforms and everything, they can just kind of hold objects pretty nicely as a square and I can orient to orientate them pretty much in direction. They do they do generate quite a quite a strong sense of balance, you know, especially in terms of how the how all the different patterns have a kind of richness and a, and a kind of foldedness, but the way that they, they stack on top of each other, actually, it, it, they feel to me quite stable. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about um, the sort of, it, in terms of within those compositional choices, the way that you stack and layer the kind of objects themselves and where and where those come from? You know, there's in the image that we're looking at right now, there is mm -hmm. the, something that looks like probably paper uh, right at the top. Then there's a kind of finer pattern with red and a kind of darker blue that that looks more textile. Then there's, there's perhaps a cushion, and then in the um, in the platform, you know, there's a pattern at the top, and then and then what what's clearly sort of like legs. Yes. Yeah, so this piece started with the platform. And usually they don't, usually they start with the bundles, but the platform was a, one of those 10 by 10 studies that I just kind of adhered to a wooden base, so to speak. And that pattern is from a dress that I made that I did give away at some point. And then the, uh, the piece of paper on the top is actually from a textile when I was renting a studio from Heather, Heather Nickel in Artscape. And then the middle thing is knitted on my knitting machine. And then the cushion is from my childhood and it actually belongs to my sister, Jennifer, which she lent to me. I just haven't given it back. So the sort of sources of the material really kind of vary greatly. Yes, and for example, this one is more current. I just completed it in 2020. And the, uh, the object itself is sitting underneath a crumpled piece of paper, which you see on the top, that's painted to look like the textile form. And the textile form, when I make these bundles, they are dresses that I used to be able to wear but can't wear now because I can't do up the buttons or the zippers or simply fit into it. And it has two dresses wrapped together and hand stitched. But in the center of these bundles are personal kind of notes and the notes are intentionally left secret, but they are kind of like my fears and apprehensions, kind of like that inner stuff that I don't want to let out in any way. But uh, so I bundle them in there. And in a way, the work becomes a layering of the inside the sculpture and then inside the sculpture in the photograph and then painted on. So as the work kind of changes from being one kind of material to another, it kind of gets this layer of wrapping in a sense. So that the layering of materials <clears throat> and the layering of textures in a way echoes a particular sort of conceptual and almost narrative layering for you. Yes. And Do then when I show this work, I often will show them with narratives that accompany the photographs or the sculptures. And those narratives are not set on any particular work. Like it might show one time and have one narrative and another time and have another narrative. As with the sculptures, they might be stacked in one way and then stacked in another way. You'll see objects repeated in photographs. And I think of the photographs as that kind of final seal or the staccato of multiple finishes or multiple endpoints. So it really becomes the kind of documentation of a, 
of a process of working through the material. Yes. Are they to some degree portraits? And I, and I ask that, and I ask that because in in pointing out what you said about the, the square, I think that the, the interesting thing about it is that it, it occupies the space right in between the portrait and the landscape, you know, and, and, and that makes me think of the relationship that these works might have both to portraiture, but also to abstraction. And so how do you think of this sort of in between space that the work occupies? That's interesting because they are all kind of portraits in a certain sense because they used to be skins that would cover my my own body that have been discarded in a way. So they're kind of like the leftover, like the molting process. Yes. And this one inside the textile that's repeated in the platform, there is another textile that in the pocket there's a note as I was talking about before. And on the textile, it's hand stitched to change, change the color of the squares. Does the, does, does, does color itself uh, hold some kind of symbolic meaning for you? Like, I know that they, that the, that, that a lot of the patterns come from objects in your life and come from clothing that you, that you have, that, that perhaps you're sort of using differently now. Um, but in the, in the images themselves, you know, there, there are very definite sort of decisions being made in terms of the palette. How do you, what kind of effect does color have for you in these works? Well, I love color and I love using it to kind of punctuate the surface in a way to kind of create shocking moments where there might be colors that don't really go together or patterns that don't go together, but I've stuck them together. And also I want to mention that in this image that you've shown here, the three circles on that object are light refractions from mm. a disco ball that I had one of my studio assistants hold when I was taking the photograph of it. Well, and there's, and, and, it, and it sort of layers between the sort of black and white of the background and then all the really kind of bold uh, sort of between the sort of higher key pops of color and the softer sort of analogous palettes. So that, that, that echo is, was that echo uh, something that you found in the composition as a kind of accident or was it very much planned to, to sort of lay it between those two squares? Well, the object that I started with here is that textile and a friend sent it to me in the mail and it's a vintage textile from her grandmother. Normally, I wouldn't start with a textile this kind of soft, right? But then I added some color to, to the grid on the form. So the pink that you see on the textile is actually hand embroidered on there. Uh -huh. And then I just placed it on this black and white background, which is missing a dot. Missing a dot it, oh, in, in, the in the pattern. Is that is that kind of in the in the sort of in the close to the middle of of it in the right hand on the left hand side? Yes, I can see that. So, how much room is there for happenstance or accident in these compositions that seem quite carefully thought out? Well, the accidents happen and I just leave them when they do. I like to cover the surface, like in my background right here, there's an accident. I forgot the, the flourish on top of there. But I just kind of leave that to just kind of exist in the work as being a kind of sort of embellishment in a way, something I didn't expect like I'm doing this one pattern on my table right now. You might see it on my Instagram feed, but I didn't notice it before. It's got an optical illusion from a certain angle. It looks 3D. Oh. Hold on, I've just got to drink a little water. Of course. And so I plan on 
using that effect in the final photograph somehow. So there's almost two layers of observation. There's the sort of initial observation that you might do when setting up the, the sort of sculptural arrangements and then a second set of observations that you might do looking at the photographs afterwards. Mm -hmm. One thing that I am really interested in exploring with you in terms of this work, because of things that I'm interested in in my own work, is the way in which in some of the in some of the work, another element that's sort of really important is also your body. Um, so can you talk a little bit about when and how your body enters the work? Thank you. Yeah, and this is the perfect image to show here. It's cut off a little bit by your image, but what this is, it's a glove that I made. It took me six attempts to make this glove, but it's stitched by hand and then it's stitched through the surface of a painting, which I am got my left arm through that hole with this glove on it and I'm holding this crumpled piece of paper and then it's photographed you know shown as a photograph but I think that this is a really important piece in that all the other pieces before this had the clothing without my body in them they were a kind of receptacle of the absent body whereas this one the body's really present so from this this is where the newer work came from the photographs that I'm just they've just been printed and they're going to the framer so can you talk a little bit about the gesture in the hand you know that there's there's something so sort of beautiful and delicate in the in the kind of really specific way in which you're holding that that sort of bundle yeah i think that it was just i take a bunch of photographs and then i choose one where i like the play of the light on the fingers and it wasn't really particularly more specific than that other than my left hand because i have parkinson's my left hand doesn't really work very well mm. like if i try to twist it so that kind of contorted shape sort of came naturally to this hand whereas this hand i can use and that's very interesting in the work because the body plays out through duration in the reproduction of the pattern. You know, I'm making these patterns to look like patterns of cloth, but in a sense, these kind of acts of reproducing or acts of making pattern is sort of haptic for me in the sense that my body picks up this knowledge of pattern where it learns the pattern and it goes, but it's also about my my body in the sense that it tests the limits of my hand uh. and my right hand is still skilled to be able to do this work at this fine kind of delicate sense, almost that my hand is able to do it better than my eyes. And I do wear magnifying glasses sometimes. Well, one of the things that occurs to me as you as you as you as you're speaking of this process is that your body, you know, perhaps extending and actually breaking through ideas of of portraiture, your body is not just there as a figure, or it's perhaps there almost barely as a figure, and is really in the image as a kind of agent. Yes. You know? Can we skip to the one with the green dress on? Yes. Is this it? Yes. So the bottom of this is cropped off. This photograph is about the, the dimensions of the whole Instagram feed. But what this is, is it looks like I'm wearing a mask and I'm holding these gloves on the mask. But what I'm actually doing is I'm doing a back bend so that my head is out of the way. Like, yes, that's another one. But the thing is that the dress that I'm wearing, you'll see it's got a mirrored effect. So what I've done is I've hand painted every pattern on that dress. So in a sense, I mean, it's mirrored this way like this, but every single one of those little shapes is only reproduced once. 
because it looks like a repeat pattern, but it's really not. So each panel of the pattern to sew is actually hand painted. Like it would be equivalent of hand painting on a, on a dress itself. But what I've done is I've made films and then screen printed at Open Studio. Shout out because I've been the- Artist in residence. Yes, the Nick Novak Fellowship this year. And so that's enabled me to do this really beautiful screen printing on text files. Well, in, and the, it, it, and you've also sort of echoed the pattern in the sort of hood that you're wearing. Is that a different fabric? Is that a different material? That is a different material. It's Japanese paper that's been screen printed and then paper mache onto a crumpled piece of paper. And then in the in the action that you were there's almost there's almost a kind of sequence or a relationship happening between that image and this image where you've sort of taken your head off. Can you talk a little bit about that gesture? Yes, you know, it's interesting because when I pose for these photographs, I'm not really sure what's going to come out of them. So I kind of try to pick the weirdest shots. And this one was strange in that Partially, it looks like I'm holding a baby, but it also looks like it's got a big smile on its face, like I'm lifting my head off. And these are very new, so I'm just kind of coming to terms with these photographs and what they're doing visually. I don't completely understand them yet. That well, and that that to me, I think, makes makes the process quite exciting, in a way. W one thing that, at least in the in the sort of body of work that is being shown right now, the thing that you that you do see that that's very sort of uh, that comes through quite strongly for me is the way that the body is sort of implied in the in the folded clothes. The way your body kind of starts uh, getting into the image, you know, it also it almost starts inhabiting the image and then you sort of make space within your figure again there's a there's a there seems to be a, a kind of play between revealing and concealing uh of the body and revealing and concealing you know and really a, a kind of concealing of uh narrative that that echoes perhaps the the the, the concealing of narrative can you talk a little bit about, about how uh your use of your body how do you sort of come to think of you, the use of your body in terms of these ideas of revealing and concealing? Okay, that's another interesting point I just want to talk about before I go off on a tangent. Is the title for the show, Our Relationship is Beautiful Due to the Distance? Is that kind of disconnect between the viewer and myself or the image of myself how I see myself and, and what is actually projected either into a mirror or in a photograph. Because, you know, with Parkinson's, my notion of who I am is what I used to be oh. instead of what I am now. So part of the reason is because, you know, it's a very painterly act to cover the surface of something, you know, in the sense that you're creating a skin. So I'm interested in keeping that skin solid as much as possible. Well, it, it, it sort of generates, uh, for me, what, what feels like a kind of consistently activated interplay between the kind of figure and the ground. Uh, and in a way you, you're, you're imagining new new ways for looking at the body you know a body that is sort of whose head is sort of connected through the handling of its hands which i think is a kind of beautiful metaphor even for for a kind of distance from oneself that one has to take sometimes in, in these times or, or what you're talking about in terms of how parkinson's has shifted the, the way you relate to your own body that's so interesting because i'm writing a book called upstairs and upstairs means like 
I live upstairs, but also the idea of the space of the mind and that separation of mind and body. Does it feel like it? Does it feel like a separation for you? Well, it does a lot of the time because there are times I want to be able to pick up an object and just drop it. And I have a hard time telling my hand to let go. This hand can do it. So if I pick up something, I can't throw it across the room with my other hand. It's a kind of strange kind of relationship with the body also where your proprioception gets a little messed up. Well, and yet in the work, you, you, you claim such kind of authorial control over the composition. You know, like you're really able to kind of assert an eye, a sensibility. Uh, in terms of going back to this idea of composition and and the, the ways in which I think as artists, it's one of the it's one of the things we do as artists, you know, in, in the way that I think musicians, uh, we think a lot of composition in terms of what musicians do or in terms of what other kinds of creative people might do. It's sometimes perhaps less thought of in terms of visual art. But I, one of the things that I really enjoy about your work is that it brings the composition to the fore. Are there in in relationship to this particular body of work echoes with other artists, whether they are painters or performance artists? that you that you feel are particularly relevant yes that's a pretty big question because there's a lot of work that i feel really relevant i think that visually i'm very interested in certain abstract painters which is where the abstract painting reference comes in like toma axe yes who won the turner prize and I love the way that her work shows the history of its making in it, because she doesn't go back and sand things down. But then also Ligia Clark and her pieces before she started doing the creatures. There is a work by hers. There's a beautiful work by hers called uh, Bag and Stone, which is a sort of bag that's full oh, of air yes. with the stone that actually has in some of the documentation a kind of a similar feel to the way in which you're holding the the, the papier mache, uh, uh, you know, the papier mache uh, uh, object in your in your hands. But I think the beautiful thing about Ligia Clark's bag and stone is that relationship between the body and the stone is mediated through air. Yes. So when you hold that, that stone, you're not really holding the stone. It's got a very strange sensation to it. Well, it, it, I think for her, it, it was really about a certain kind of empathy, right? The, the idea of breathing with the stone, breathing as the stone, uh, and, and a certain uh, almost connection through distance, you know, or, or our ability to imagine or our impossibility of imagining this stone is a breathing thing. Yeah, it's kind of beautiful to think of her work. Sorry, I'm no getting worries. a little tense. No worries. But it's beautiful to think of her work because one of the things that has become quite important to me more recently is the notion of the pillow. Mm because my body usually tenses up like it's doing now and the pillow provides a space of comfort you know i use a lot of pillows on my bed and i change the order a lot to sleep but the pillows kind of prop up the kind of pain of the body huh. or help my body's pain structures of support yes in a way and feel free to feel free to walk around you know we can we can if you need to kind of like take you know shake it out we can yeah. totally we can totally totally do that you know something something else that i i was thinking in in terms of this idea of mobility and comfort and movement uh you were in, in when we were chatting about this when we first communicated about this you were talking about the the, the way that the home space 
uh, you know, it has had a kind of really has an impact. The way that your your living, your current and even past living spaces, really has an impact in structuring the the work. Uh, can you talk about your relationship to your studio space and and whether it is a relationship of comfort, whether it is a relationship of tension? Uh, you know, how do you how does the, the your relationship to to your working and living space? in a way come through in the work? That's a great question. And I really would like to address this because one of the things I've been really putting a lot of effort into is I'm teaching a class on this mm. for OCAD. But one of the things that I'm, okay, I'm just gonna give myself a second. Totally. So one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is when I was younger, I used to kind of think about working in the studio, like Hariki Sawa, uh -huh. Hariki Sawa, he did this piece called Dwelling. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. Can you tell me about it? Yeah, he locked himself into his apartment for two weeks, and then he did these animations on the wall like little horses moving and things like that uh -huh. and i used to think that this idea of doing this kind of project where you just locked yourself in for a while was really a great idea and also thinking about i read this book by douglas copeland that was called microsurfs and in it there's these people that are building this kind of software and they lock them one guy locks himself in a room and the others are so concerned that they stick flat food under the door so that he can eat <laughs> and i always like that idea like i want to work in the studio so hard that people have to give me flat food <laughs> but then when you're stuck inside and you're not able to go out because you don't have the right mobility devices or the right amount of care, then that becomes a little bit of a problem. You know? Absolutely. It's not so romantic. Well, it has, it, it, how do you find, does the work become a comfort to you? Does the work become an escape? Yes. Hold on. Absolutely. Can we, I know, I know this, we haven't necessarily perhaps talked about this before, but can I ask you about beauty and joy and pleasure and, and all, perhaps in relationship to the kinds of hardships that, 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 that come with this idea of, of a limited mobility, whether it is generally because of the pandemic or whether it is because of Parkinson's. I think there's it, it, one of the things that I that I experienced as a viewer looking at the work is a, is a, is a great degree of just visual pleasure and joy. How does that how does that operate for you as a maker? And does it operate for you? Does the pleasure and the and the joy of the work, if, if you find it, does it operate for you differently as a viewer once once the work is done? Things. So I kind of think of myself as always a maker. As a viewer, I'm always a maker too. So I'm always like, oh, I need to try this out instead. But the process of making, I think, is very therapeutic for me in that I like to work on the backdrops, for example, because there's, they're four by seven feet. Okay. And just to give you some scale. You so know, they are quite large. They're large, yes. So that I can stand in front of them or that I can wrap them around the stacks. But the thing is that when I'm working and making the work, I kind of work through a range of emotions as I'm working. And one of those emotions is boredom. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, like how do you work through boredom and get on the other side of it? And I'm pretty interested in that space. Uh, as a teacher, don't you find is like the one thing that's the hardest to get across to a student? You know, it's like you actually, the more bored you get, the closer you are maybe to hitting something. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm interested in getting through boredom because we have all this stuff in our lives that fills up our lives visually, knowledge-wise, databases, videos, TV. But when you work on the, the work and you don't listen to any sounds other than the ambient ones, what starts to happen, you know, you get more into the kind of haptic space of hand memory and also, I do want to talk a little bit about craft. I, that's exactly where I was going. Good. Do you, well, is there anything you want to say, like right off the bat with regards to craft? Yes, craft for me is very important. And it's kind of the craftsmanship of making. So the thing is that the outfits that I make for the newer work, the objects that I make are just as beautiful on the inside or if you are making a painting on the back, you know, as they are on the outside. So I think of them as a complete and total kind of sponge instead of just the surface. And that's where I think of myself more as a sculptor in the sense that a lot of times the platforms will be made with say a mortise and tenon joint but then when it's painted you can't even tell that's right well and and i think part of what in terms of how to push through those moments of boredom and and how to allow that sort of hollowed out space in this very visual sort of life that we have it, I feel like I feel like there's a relationship between craft and a certain almost work ethic. Mm -hmm. You know, like it, it feels to me like craft, wh whatever craft is. And I think for me, you know, ideas are crafted in the same way and with the same delicacy as textiles are crafted. In the same way that sort of garments are constructed. Like I really see a deep, deep, deep relationship between craft. The, the crafting of things and the crafting of of ideas um you know i want to go to this this sort of image now there's there's sort of layers layers of, of crafting that that go into it do you do, do you do you think of it in terms of a, a kind of discipline that it that it allows you to, to sort of have within the work well i build my work very slowly over time so it might start out as one thing or a idea over here that I'm working on that I kind of give my hands something to do and it might not turn into a photograph for a few years. But, you know, one thing I'm pretty interested in is also when I'm at those moments where I'm having difficulty moving to be able to make work in bed is really liberating for me because I hand stitch and hand stitching in bed is a perfect location. So you can, you, you know, there's a kind of fluidness to the materials. You know, there's a kind of fluidity to the materials that allows you to work with them in, in different ways. How how long you know how long have you kept some of the sort of objects that appear in the how long have, how long have you had some of the objects that appear in the work? Oh, I've, this image is all the two textiles I've had for about seven years, and the top textile I got that from Jerome Have. Mm -hmm. He gave me that textile. A lot of times people will give me textiles. And then they become almost like, in a sense, a piece of them becomes embedded in my work. 
so they they, they, they really do kind of trace your your relationships in that way mm -hmm. I'm just being mindful of time. We're at we're we're at just after forty minutes. Is there anything else we 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 should sort of address before maybe opening it up to the the comments and any questions that people might have? Yeah, I'm sure I have a lot of ideas that I meant to talk about. Exactly. I have a couple of other things I I, I really want to know about. But just because I want to make sure that if folks have questions that they have a chance, should we open it up? Sure. Okay, I'm gonna open it up. Turn on commenting. So, folks, if if anybody has any questions that you'd like to ask Michelle, uh, you can absolutely type them into the comment box, and and um, we'll sort of read them out, and and Michelle can address them. Oh, there's a question. Uh, okay, so one question we have is. How does medium play a role in your work? Thoughts on mechanical process versus digital? Yeah, I move pretty fluidly between digital and analog. All the things that I make in the studio pretty much are analog until I print out the photographs or take the photographs. I'm interested in actually I'll go back in sometimes and work on top of the photographs and I will put like a line and then there'll be a Photoshop drop shadow and then when I print it out, I'll screen print that line over top. So it plays with that space between the analog and digital. Have you ever exhibited the, the sort of the stacks? Uh, it in themselves as kind of um, sculptures? Yes, at Corkin for the 40th anniversary show. That's amazing. Megan's got a question. Yes. Michelle, I would love to hear your thoughts about our current dependence on digital platforms. And I'm, I can't seem to read the, the rest of it. Um, but if you can, uh, let me see. Uh, on current uh, digital platforms and the impact this might have in, um, and then I can't seem to access the rest of the question. Um, but Megan, if you'd like to sort of ask it in the in the chat, I think we'll be able to see it more fully. But uh, do you have you know do you have a, 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 a what are your thoughts on even the, the very medium of, of this exchange that we're having, because if, if this if there wasn't a pandemic, we would probably be having this conversation in a room full of people and the work would be around us. So how does yes. doing it this way change things for you as an artist? Well, I'm more interested in this work in the physical sense, because the work really is so dependent on that physicality of surface. And oftentimes people will look at my work and go, what am I looking at? Even though they're looking at a photograph, they might even think it's a painting. But also when I was younger, I used to love working digitally. I am moving away from the digital. I love the space of the analog. There's just something beautiful about working with my hands and looking at a screen all the time, I find it's problematic well, in the sense that I'm losing some of my eyesight. I have a hard time seeing screens. Me too, says Megan. Well, there's a, there's a certain sort of depth that that analog images have that the digital that the digital can sometimes not necessarily the screen doesn't have. Yeah, I mean, some of the work that I've shown at Corkin and some of the prior work, I've actually woven my own textiles. So I go back and I'm kind of reverse engineering the work in a way. We have another question there. Yes. So Jennifer Ray Forsyth asks, can you talk a little bit about the use of pattern 
and how that evolved over time in the trajectory of previous bodies of work. What impact has Parkinson's what impact has Parkinson's changed this relationship? Yes, that's my sister. Hi, Jen. So I have, interestingly, is the new word kind of, in a way, harkens back to my graduate thesis work oh. in a very strange way. Because in graduate school, I made these huge photograph or paintings of kings with patterns. Everything was was kind of sampled though from art history, kind of an 80s pastiche in a way, even though it was 20 years ago, I graduated 20 years ago. It wasn't in the 80s, but it had that kind of sensibility to it. But when I go back and look at those paintings, the new ones are still like a figure on a background, oh. which is kind of strange to me. But I've always kind of, well, wait, when I was, when I first got Parkinson's, I was making work about social issues, going out traveling. Uh -huh. And then I got diagnosed and I thought, what happens if you make work about what's around you huh. in your home? So I looked in the closet and I was married at that time and my husband was away. So I started making these paintings of his shirts. And so are there are there in the sort of in, in the way that your body has changed over the last number of years? at the level of craft or at the level of, of the skill, because there's a great level of skill in the work. What are some of the things that Parkinson's, Parkinson's has almost allowed you to discover about yourself as an artist that you might not have thought about, you know, at the beginning of the, the you know, when you were just making those paintings as a grad student? Yeah, because when I was making the paintings before Parkinson's, they were just kind of one level in a sense. They were about the pattern and about beauty and about what I could do. But now I feel that the work is much more rich. It's become more about, you know, the translation of one medium to another, playing with the work as it goes along. The work is constantly altering and changing. Well, and, and, and it even has layers that that really kind of have to be drawn out, uh, you know, pulled in from the center of the work in the way that the narratives, um, yeah. in the way that the narratives are. To maybe begin, if there's other questions, we can definitely sort of uh, read them out. We've got another couple of minutes before the Instagram Live will sort of start timing out on us. Now I want to make sure that we don't miss anything, but um, I'll sort of insert a, a question from things that I'm curious about. Uh, in terms of these narratives, um, you were saying that the narratives don't necessarily, are, aren't necessarily paired directly with works, but how do you draw them out? Uh, you know, and how do you choose which ones to sort of place within a show? Mm -hmm. Well, during the pandemic, I was just making these stacks independently. And then I decided to make a mega stack in my apartment with a whole bunch of different things. You can see it on my Insta feed if you go back, I think. But then I started making these pieces that you're showing here from the mega stack where I took them out of the, the mega stack and photographed them. But I feel like they just kind of come to me from either the backdrop pattern or from the patterns on the things on the bundles and then i'll put them together kind of arbitrarily in a painterly decision way so it's almost like a chance operation that you create between them yeah in a certain sense but not chance in a 
ARP kind of way, mm. throwing them over my shoulder. <laughs> Somebody else has another question. Uh, yeah. So, Linda Sorman, do certain materials invite you to behave or misbehave as an artist? Yes, and if what, how? That's a great question. I know, that is a great question. Because, for example, like the piece that we're looking at, this is a shirt wrapped around a pair of jeans. And it's interesting because it's very hard. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but when I'm stitching it together, I'm making these stitches where I want to make them even stitches where I'm stitching them as like in a line, but oftentimes I don't have the ability to do that and hold the object together. Or like, I'm just gonna turn this. Oh, wow, gorgeous. So this right here has got a lining on it and you can see the stitches is making this misbehave. It's kind of an error where in sewing, if you stitch the lining on, too much, too tightly, it pulls up. But also, this is the mm. the mask that goes with it. Beautiful! Oh my god! It's out of paper mache. But this comes from working it during the pandemic, where I've been looking at Paul Virilio's photographs of bunkers. Mm as a kind of protective structure almost. Yes. It looks a little disturbing. The other, the other uh, sort of reference How much that time up, we have? We've got maybe a couple of minutes. Are there any other questions that people might have? There's another thing that happened here mm -hmm. is that during the pandemic, I printed this cloth to here, and then I didn't print this piece. So that's why this is not going to print over top of the flag. Well, and, and is that a direction that you're, you know, maybe to maybe to sort of begin to wrap up, can you tell us a little bit of from the from the moment the, 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 the work has um, finished? Are there is there somewhere that you're going with now that's sort of new from the work that we were seeing in the show? Any new directions, kind of like this layering of, of partial patterns on top of each other? Yes, this is a new direction where I'm interested in overlaying pattern on top of this. But then the next one after this is just going to be black and white with different patterns. But I've been very influenced by the person, I can't remember her name, but the designer of Come to Garçon, I've been looking at a lot of her work and just thinking about pushing clothing because in a certain way of being safe in the clothing that I'm making. So pushing it into a spot that's not quite as safe. And, and in a way, creating spaces of unevenness, you know, whereas the, the work in the show, there's a kind of evenness to all those, those garments. Yes, and not just evenness, but a rule following that Linda's talking about, I think. It's like, what if I, in the seam of one thing, put an, an arm from something else coming out of it? So even rethinking the way we think about the body or how the body is assembled. Yeah. Lovely. Lovely. Influenced by Johannes Sitz, he did this really interesting performance where all these clothes were sewn together and he put his body into different parts of it. I've been thinking about that piece as well. Amazing. Shout out. Oh, and these new works, shout out, they're funded by TAC, Toronto Arts Council. Amazing. It seems like we have only a couple of minutes left, uh, Michelle, it's so like we don't get cut off. I really, really want to thank you for inviting me to have this conversation with you. I want to thank you on behalf of everybody watching for the generosity in showing us your workspace and, and taking the time to really talk about this work. 
uh, really looking forward to being able to see it in, in person. Yes, thanks. I'm looking forward to my show at Corkin. Unfortunately, it got postponed. Well, because we'll be... We'll be there whenever, whenever, whenever it, 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 it does kind of happen in the flesh. Great. And thank everyone for your questions. Thank you so much for the questions. Thank you, everyone at Corkin. Thank you so much, Michelle. Please check out, um, check out the link on the Corkin Gallery um, Instagrams so you can see uh, the work that we've been talking about. And we will be posting this Instagram live so you 